Howdy. Go ahead and grab a shield and get comfy. We're about to make us a Caesar salad, chopping up these Empire boys. But before we do, let's iron you out on a Sturgia campaign real quick. All right, let's talk cultural bonuses. And I'm going to be honest with you, the Sturgeon ones are a little meh. Recruiting and upgrading infantry, 25% cheaper. If you're going to run an infantry-heavy army, like I suggest you do with Sturgia, if you've played Bannerlord at all, you know the infantry tends to take the brunt of the damage in a lot of battles. And uh, it's no it's no different for Sturgia. And especially if you're going infantry focus you'll see a lot of your guys are going to die. So it is a bonus you'll use a lot, but it's not really that exciting. The next one is better. The armies lose 20% less daily cohesion is actually pretty big. And it's really nice when you pull together those big armies. And it's especially strong for Sturgeon armies because there's just a huge amount of land you have to protect. And moving from one side to the other takes a lot of time. And sometimes you have to pull your army all the way from one front over in the west all the way to fight the Kazates in the east. And it takes a while to get over there and pull it all together. So having a little less cohesion loss uh, gives you a little more time to get it together and use it. These are both useful bonuses, but they're not really that exciting. And how in the hell did Sturgeons not get a bonus in snow or no move penalty in the snow or reduced snow penalty? I don't know. I mean, it seems like the culture would be very adapted to moving in the snow efficiently. The Batanians get the forest reduction. The Asarai get a bonus in the desert, but the Sturgeons don't get a bonus in the snow. Makes no sense to me. That's what I would replace the top one with. But it is what it is, and this is what you get. The 20% more relationship penalty, really not a big deal. If you want to build any rep with anyone, Capture some enemy lords, which you're going to be doing a lot of, and drop them off in their dungeon. And you'll raise your rep up to 100 with anyone very quickly doing that. So these are very efficient bonuses, and they are very applicable to a Sturgeon campaign. But they're not really exciting, and they don't give a ton of advantage. Most certainly not like some of the other factions do. Always love to show off my guy and show off my build, give you a little inspiration. For your Sturgia campaign, look at my man here, Bolvir, the Blood Axe. Just a complete badass. And I got to tell you, you got to do a Sturgia playthrough. You've had plenty of time with the bows and the horses and the combined arms bullshit. It's time for you to grab an army of Vikings with shields and go tear shit up for a little bit. It's going to be good for you. And look at my wife here, huh? Look at all these heirs. Like a vending machine does when all you got to do is push a button. They don't make them like my Vicenia. Now, when it comes to build, you can see right away that I've kind of focused in one area. And this is your bread and butter, this two-handed. You come in this tree, you get damage against shield, you get more damage, damage against beast. There's some really fun perks in here like this Berserker one where when you're at less than half hit points, you get 20% more damage. This Vandal is incredible. You get that giant two-handed axe and you boost it up with all these stats and then you give it 25% armor pin. You're one-shotting everything in the game. And then, of course, Way of the Great Axe. Is there a more Sturgeon talent in the game? I think not. So this is the one that's going to give you that stacking attack speed and damage up here. And you hit this at 250 and then you can go all the way up to 330 to really max it out. And just incredible how much damage you can put out and how many people you can kill. I know you can tear guys up with your Volandia Lance and you can hit them from range with your Batanian bows and your Conj Guard. But there's something about getting in there with the Great Axe and chopping them up two, three at a time, that is just unbelievably fun. When it comes to finding axes, of course, people will tell you to smith and stuff, but you really don't need to. This is that two-handed axe that you're going to want to look for. They sell in Sturgeon Towns is where I found mine, but look at that, 121 length, 138 cut. You can 
of course, smith your own and get even better stats. But honestly, you'll see in the battle part, you don't need to. This thing, I have killed thousands of troops with this thing. And it just takes them down two, three, four at a time. You just become a blender swinging this thing around. There's a two-handed axe called Blackheart you can get from tournaments. That's nice if you're just looking one to get started on. Make sure you get some really good armor. I had some better looking armor, but then I found this lordly heavy scale armor. Look at that. 65 body armor, but look at the arm armor. 24 there, 24 there, 30 there. I mean, it's just, this guy is a tank. He takes crossbow, bolts, arrows, it doesn't matter. And remember, once my health gets down past half, I get a 20% increased damage to my two-handed. So I become even more of a monster. So definitely, definitely check out that two-handed. You're in for a good time. But there will be times when you're advancing on the enemy or you need to close the gap or sometimes you get isolated or it's just one-on-one, -on -one, you're fighting a bandit boss or you're in a tournament, you're going to need that one-hander up. Because the real trick with having this build is sometimes it's best to be in two-handed mode when you're on the flank and the you're kind of behind the enemy and you can chop them down two or three at a time. But sometimes you're going to need to swap over to the one-hander and shield for the protection it offers. And I will tell you, at this level of one-handed, everything is still pretty much a one-shot. It's really remarkable, especially if you get real good at hitting in the head. I'm not great at the combat, but I do okay. Also, remember with this two-handed and one-handed, maxing out these trees and getting all these perks, while it's awesome for you that you can kind of switch between going two-handed and one-handed and all the tactical options that provides, I'm also the captain of my entire infantry army. So there's a ton of buffs in here for your infantry line where they do more damage. They get speed movement. This arrow catcher talent is incredible. It makes your shield wall pretty much impervious to fire from the front. And then you slap it on your back when you grab your two-hander. So when you're getting to work, if there's archers behind you or around you or horse archers or whatever, it's protecting you from them. So it gives your, you know, just... That you get a ton of use out of having a giant shield on you. And this soups it up when you're in the shield wall formation. And here, more experience for your infantry and you're leveling up infantry nonstop. Very nice. 10% melee weapon damage to your by your infantry. See, so leveling up your one-handed is very important. And there's going to be times when you really do need to swap over to your one-hander. And what's really great as Sturgia... If you look at my gear here, you can find these rectangular bitted axe. My whole crew has these. Every companion, my wife, they have great length for an axe at 84, but they got that 82 cut. And when you've got an axe and you're throwing axes and you've got a bigger axe on your back for when you need it, on top of your army full of axemen, just mulching up guys and shields and whatever the fuck gets in your way. It's just awesome. Just a little tip when it comes to leveling these up. I use two-handed mostly in battles because you just let your infantry line attack and then you kind of work from the flank, get behind the enemy and then just start taking them out. And also, you know, you'll be taking down cavalry and stuff with it. So you'll level it pretty quick in battles. Although there are times, of course, you need to switch to your shield and one-hander. And then if I'm doing bandit camps and of course tournaments and things like that, I switch over to the one-hander to level it up. And then once I got my two-hander almost all the way leveled up, I switched over to the one-hander and a few sieges, and that's what it do it. But just switch between them and level them both up. The perks going to help not only you, but your soldiers. And getting it all the way up to these levels just makes you an absolute destroyer of men. You've got to do throwing because it's a blast. You're going to buff up your throwing and you're going to have a good time doing it. And you're also going to buff up your troops throwing. And you've got the Sturgeon Axeman and the Heroic Linebreaker both come with throwing axes. And so you come in here and you give them extra damage, extra ammunition, just a ton of buffs that you give out here. Doing extra damage to mounts. There's a real fun one here, knockoff, where if you hit enemy cavalry, you got with a heavy hit, 25% chance to dismount. Oh, and here's another one that I really enjoyed. Last hit where 50% extra damage to enemy that are below 50%. So it's kind of like an execute. 
painful headshots. This is the one where I finally switched to throwing axes. Up until this point, the skill level 200, and I grabbed the splinters, I actually was using javelins. And I suggest when you're first leveling up your throwing, you're going to fight a lot of sea raiders up in Sturgeon lands, and you're going to loot a lot of javelins. Just grab you a couple stacks. Hopefully you can get those large stack ones that come with extra. It just takes a while to level your throwing. And then once you get splinters here, you switch over to throwing axes because it's just so badass to throw an axe into a guy's shield and watch it disappear into dust. And remember, with your throwing, the fastest way to level it is in defensive sieges, dropping rocks down on top of the guys trying to cut open and get through the gate. So if you can get into defensive sieges as a mercenary or when you're first starting out, sometimes I'd like to follow a big army and I see if they're going to hit a town. And I think that, hey, we might be able to actually defend this with a little help. I hop in there, drop some rocks on top of those guys, and that's going to level up your throwing like you level up engineering with siege weapons. You're just going to, every time you drop one of those rocks, you're going to get 5, 10, 15 points at the beginning. Athletics, what do I tell you about you're going to be down in the shit you're going to be kicking ass. What do you need? Athletics, athletics, athletics. The weight penalty reduction is huge for helping you move and weave in and out of combat. The knockdown resistance, the running speed, all of that adds up to you being a melee machine. Because when you pop out this two-hander, sometimes you need to step up and cleave some guys down. And then you can step back and kind of dodge their attacks or even kite backwards while you're chopping so that you're out of range and you can just keep chopping their shield or whatever until you can get them down or fall back to your guys. Just the ability to move and weave in and out of striking distance is just so powerful. And the better you are at it, the more of a monster you become. I mean, this maxing out your athletics makes you just a mobile monster. You're already a badass. You do all this damage, got this awesome armor, and now you can move around faster than most people on the field. You're just like a Greek god out there. And just coming through these talents, I mean, movement speed right here, reduction in armor weight. Also, remember, I'm the captain. Some more movement speed for my troops. Very nice, especially when you're running that melee heavy army and you've got to close the distance, especially under fire. The faster you do that, the better. This imposing stature at 75 skill level is one of the strongest perks in the game. I mean, plus 30% persuasion chance is huge. Really helps you seal the deal with those hotties and a little party size doesn't hurt either. More melee damage for you and your troops. This one is huge for both you and as a captain because it doesn't matter what you do, those cavalry are going to be charging into your big pile of dudes and just running into you does damage and this is going to reduce that damage by 40% and 30% for your men. Very, very important talent for your infantry captain to have and if you're fighting on foot, this is a almost essential talent, I think, given the amount of cavalry in the game. And remember up here with durable and strong that you only need to go six in endurance and nine in vigor because you get another attribute right here with endurance and you get another vigor attribute here, strong. So if you're going to come this high in athletics, count for that in your build. Throwing weapon and throwing skill for my troops. And look at this one. You saw my badass armor, but look here, 10% more armor while on foot, which I always am. And then look, plus five armor to all equipped armor pieces of foot troops and your formation. So what, they have four or five pieces? That's an extra 25 army. That's crazy great benefit that you're providing to your entire army, basically, since 80% of my army is infantry. And then, of course, Mighty Blow. They block your attack. You stun them a little longer. And then look at that personal trait. Plus one hit point for every skill above 50. So I'm at an extra 38 hit points here. More speed, more damage, more attributes. It just, it's crazy. It's a crazy powerful tree. Don't overlook it and make sure you max it out past this 275 because this build really takes advantage of all of the traits in the athletic tree. Final note on athletics, just do it. And right here, roguery. Gotta have it for that Sturgia playthrough. You'll notice I grabbed the cruel trait. Why? Because I will decimate everything 
of my enemies, right? I burn the villages. I chop up the armies. I grab the nobles. I never let them go. I take them and I ransom them. I'm not here to be your friend or to be loved. I'm here to be feared. And the number one thing you're going to need to build up your kingdom or your empire, whatever, is money. And what's the best way to get money outside of smithing? (laughs) And I don't ever include smithing in my guides just because it's too easy. And it's cool to make your own weapons and stuff, but it's a lot of work, a lot of time investment to get it up unless you use mods and cheese it and all that. And you just don't need to. I'm all, I mean, I'm rolling in money down here. I'm at a, I mean, look at that minus 12,000 between garrison and party expenses. I don't give a damn. And tribute payments. I'm paying five grand because I started an empire and I'm trying to keep the peace on certain fronts while I deal with these empire guys at the moment. But it doesn't matter because with this level of roguery, I, I get so much loot in a big battle that I have to go three, four, five towns to sell it all. So I'm just rolling in money nonstop. Battle loot is the number one way to get money in this game. And just by increasing your level, you increase the amount of loot you have. Also remember, if your steward has these perks where you can donate discarded armors or discarded weapons, you can turn it into experience. Well, the more loot you get, the more experience. So you can stuff a bunch of troops into a fief you take It's that you want to keep defended. And now you need to build up another army real quick. Grab a bunch of recruits, win some battle, and then you're going to get a ton of loot and you just start ramping them up very quickly. The talents are fine. I mean, a 5% raid speed here. No morale loss for converting bandit prisoners. When you first start out grabbing some of those sea chiefs and sea raider leaders or whatever, those guys are pretty powerful early game and they're nice to throw into your army. And then, of course, you can grab a leadership trait that allows you to upgrade them up into the Sturgeon Noble Tree once they get to max level and you have a war mount for them. So that can be useful. At this point in the game, though, I pretty much just use Sturgeon troops. So I don't really grab a lot of Sea Raiders, but I can if I need to quickly, which is kind of nice. Manhunter's really nice, just getting a lot more money for selling captives and you're going to be catching a lot of armies and you're going to have a lot of captives. So 20% more money on top of 45% more battle loot is just crazy. When this one really shines is in those sieges where they lose the siege and then you've got three, 400, sometimes six, 700 prisoners. This will really kick up how much money you make from selling. You're out and about raiding and you've lost some guys and you're in enemy territory. You come across 20 or 30 sea raiders You can talk to them, they'll surrender, and you can just throw them in your party pretty easily as replacements until you can get back to Sturgeon lands. So that can be nice. But the key thing with roguery is that you're going to be raiding, you're going to be hitting caravans, you're going to be selling dudes for a ransom. You are going to level your roguery. And look, all I did was put five focus points here. I only have two in cunning. And I still got up to 181, and that's plus 45% battle loot. And I'm rolling in money. So, And this is going to give you money to get good gear for yourself, get good gear for your hot wife who's shelling out sons for you, get good gear for your companion. Doesn't matter what you need. You're going to be able to do it because you put some points in that roguery. And if you're doing that authentic Sturgia playthrough, known for being raiders, known for being destructive, give it to them. And right here, this is my core build. One-handed, two-handed, throwing, athletics, roguery. Whatever else you want to do, I'm going to make my arguments for them. But you do what you want. You want to do some smithing? Great build for that since you're easily max it out by just throwing five focus points in it. I went ahead and grabbed my own medic just because it's such a pain in the ass to find a medic that doesn't get pissed when you raid and stuff. So I just went ahead and made myself the medic. And I'm like, just put some snow on it, put a rag on it, eat some berries, let's go, okay? This are great perks, of course, and your infantry take horrific casualties sometimes. So it this will level up pretty quick for you, but it is nice to have. Even that little extra survival chance is actually pretty huge. I think there are medics out there that don't have that trait, and you could hire one, but I just went ahead and did it myself. And I honestly, I find this to be plenty of healing. Uh, and if I guys die, I'll get more. And then I also did engineering just because look for, with four int and five focus, I've almost maxed out this tree and you don't even need all this. I really just like to get up to where's the one, uh, here it is. 
You get fire versions of siege engines. These things are so good for taking out siege towers and rams. This just levels so easy. And I really didn't have anything else I was looking to put a lot of points into, or I really wanted to. So I went ahead and just became my own engineer. And uh, this is plenty. This is plenty of engineering. I dominate in sieges this way. So it's good enough. I do really like some of the early leadership traits just because there's such a quality of life improvement through a long campaign like this one right here, plus one troop tiers. Well, when you take over a fief, if you keep it protected and you let those villages get built up, it's not long before you're recruiting level three, level four level troops. And so it really helps you get your army up and running with elite troops quickly. Uh, being able to recruit prisoners faster is nice. And then here you get plus five party size. I have three towns. So here's plus 15 party size, some shared experience, which is nice. And then you come down here to a plus 10 party size. So overall get about 30 party size just for getting up to this 175 skill level. And uh, I'm about to cap this out, I think. But look here, recruitment rate for infantry prisoners. That would be nice to have. I don't really care too much about charm, but just by throwing three points in it, I was able to get Baby Maker. This one, influence gain from battles is really nice early. I mean, you can see right now I've got more than enough influence for everything I need. But remember, as a mercenary, influence is money. But then you get this right here, this double persuasion success is huge for recruiting lords to your faction when you break out and start your own kingdom, if that's something you want to do. I mean, you couple that up here with imposing stature, you get a plus 30% persuasion chance. And then here you get plus 10% chance for double persuasion success. It really is helpful. Those That combination is really nice. And then the extra relation is fine here. And then the rest of this is nice. I mean, I really just use this one for the recruitment slot. My blood axe, core build, one-handed, two-handed, throwing, athletics, roguery, do whatever you want after that. But you're going to have a great time getting in the shit with all these maxed out. You're going to really enjoy what the, your character's capable of. Now to the troop tree. And let's talk about these badass sturgeons. First off, they just look awesome, which is so important. First man up. This is your tanky infantry, the Sturgeon Heavy Spearman. He's got this outstanding armor, very armored. He's also got this war sword, so it does the cut damage. Nothing spectacular, but it does have that 100 length. Helps them reach out from behind that shield wall and do some damage. Uh, most importantly, they have this jagged fine steel spear. This is going to be one of your main anti-cav units other than using other cavalry and your big two-handed guys. But these guys are really good about poking those ponies, getting them to stall, and giving your other guys time to tear them up uh, while they're slowed inside your formation. Like I said, they're very tanky. I never get a ton of kills with these guys, but they're very good at doing their job. I mean, as good as the AI is at with pole arms. I mean, you know how awkward it can be sometimes. But as far as spearmen go... These guys are very good and uh, they do their job. Make sure you have some of these inside your infantry line. The Sturgy and Heavy Axemen, I've held a lot of funerals for these guys. It's a double-edged sword because they're very good killers, but they die a lot. You'll see they don't have quite the armor of the Heavy Spearmen, don't even have the shoulders. So they just seem to die a lot more. However, with this one-handed axe and... Look here, two stacks of throwing axes, which gives them, I think, six in total. And I'll show you in the battle part how many axes are flying out while you're closing with the enemy. And uh, those axes sometimes knock shields down or destroy them. They really do a good job of softening up the enemy before they hit them. And of course, with that axe, they do real good damage. And they, they really are great at killing enemy troops. Armored enemy troops, they really do a good job, but they also die. A lot. So you're going to bury a lot of Sturgeon Axemen. You can see over here with the Sturgeon Spearmen, you get that 140 pole arm and 140 and one handed. So he's very well trained. Whereas over here with the Sturgeon Axemen, you get just a touch more athletics, but you get 130 one handed, but you also get that 130 throwing. So both of these guys kind of have their role inside your infantry line. And I think it's important to use a mixture of both. But I will tell you, and you've got to do this once, 
Just stack a ton of axemen, almost all axemen. Have them hold fire, and then once you get within 50, 60 meters of the enemy, get in line formation, not shield wall, line so that you spread them out a little more, and then have them open fire. And two, 300 of these guys throwing six axes each is just hilarious to watch. As if I haven't convinced you already to fire up a Sturgia campaign, here comes the heroic line breaker, my heart be still. Look at this big boy, huh? Comes in with that monstrous 152 handed and look here, has some throwing axes on top of it. And so these guys are throwing out a ton of axes and these guys throw out a few axes as well. And then everybody charges in with their axes and gets to work. It's the Sturgeon dream. Do remember with these guys though, they don't quite have that same 50 plus armor that a lot of them have. So they are very susceptible to ranged fire, horse archers, things like that. Although they do okay. You advance in the shield wall and they'll tuck in nice and tightly behind it. And then these guys do a fantastic job of working around the flanks and chopping up infantry by the dozen. And then also they do a wonderful job of uh, taking care of cavalry too. Chopping the pony down, chopping the cavalrymen, whoever they can get that ax on. They just do a lot of damage. And of course, they have this big drilled two-handed axe. Look at that. 116 length, 114 damage on top of that 152 handed skill. They're one of my favorite troops to use in the game. Just because they look badass and they just fit that Sturgeon theme beautifully. I'm going to be completely honest with you. I didn't use either the Horse Raiders or the Bowmen at all. And I'll tell you why. It's not that they're the worst units, even though they kind of are. It's just that I really had a hard time justifying using either of these two when I could just add more of these guys and or some of the Druzenic champions, which is the noble troop, and we'll get to them after these guys. But right up here, the Sturgeon Horse Raider, you think, hey, it's kind of nice. Your shield wall's up there fighting. These guys can flank around, throw some javelins. However, the problem is he's got these awesome javelins with 101 pierce, but he's only got five of them. Then he's got this spear and this uh, big round shield. He also has that axe. However, he's got this horse that doesn't have armor. So, I mean, these horses just get eaten up by range fire or, I mean, one good shot and they're down. And especially if you play on Bannerlord difficulty, which is all I play, these guys just lose their horse very quickly. And so they're not really that effective and they don't really have that many javelins. So they go around throwing five javelins. Maybe they land a few, and then you've got this subpar cavalryman. You can look at this guy and say, well, once he loses his horse, he's got that 131 handed and 130 throwing, which are pretty good stats, given that he has pretty good weapons. But then you come over here and you look at his armor. And I mean, he's very poorly armored. His horse has no armor. And it's just like, why would I use one of these guys when I could use one of these guys or any of these guys, or especially a Druzenic champion? It's just, I, I just, I don't see the point. I really don't think you should use these guys. The Sturgeon veteran bowman. Let's start with the positive. 140 bow skill. It's a high level bow skill for a regular troop tree. After that, I mean, 121 handed, okay, but he doesn't have a shield, which I feel like he should. I feel like this should be a shielded bowman that comes with just a few arrows. He has the worst bow in the game. 52 pierce is awful. And then he has some of the worst arrows on top of it. So he has great bow skill, but not really good against armor targets at all. He does have this axe, which is pretty decent, 121 handed and no shield. So he's pretty vulnerable to damage. And then they really can't trade that well because they're not super well armored. Um, just really a not a great archer. Doesn't have the benefit of when he runs out of ammo being a great melee or, or even average in melee. He's kind of subpar in melee without the shield. I really have a hard time justifying these guys. The biggest problem I have with bringing Sturgeon Bowman at all is that one of the greatest advantages to that infantry focused Sturgeon army is that you can attack in inclement weather. When it's snowing or raining, that's a perfect time for you to attack. But if you bring a bunch of these bowmen with you, well, now you don't get that advantage. Plus, 
these are not Bowman worth setting up and flanking and getting all that. They're not going to impress you with what they do, even if you get them in a good position. They're just not. Sometimes I'll grab these guys if I'm just running around recruiting troops and I find them and I'll throw them in my thief and eventually they'll level up to this guy. I mean, in thief defense, okay, they do all right. They'll they'll do what a basic archer does and, and they'll get you some kills and they'll help you out. But other than that, I just stay away from them. And last... But certainly not least, our dearest Druzhenic champion. This guy, mwah, ah, probably my favorite. I don't know. I like the Sturgeon units. They, they, get, they get blasted, but I really like them. This guy kicks so much ass. Right away, look right there, 200 one-handed skill, 140 athletics, and 170 polearm. 170 riding on top of it. Just a complete combatant. They wreck shit on those horses. They've got this uh, Druzenic Lance that they can couch. So they're taking out just everyone they charge into. They have a giant heavy round shield, which makes them particularly good cavalry at taking on horse archers, which are a big weakness for all your ground troops, right? That heavy round shield keeps him well protected along with all this incredible armor. And he's got this war mount, of course, and it's heavily armored. So he's heavily armored. His horse is heavily armored. He's got a lance he can couch, but if he does get dismounted, he becomes even more of a badass with this 200 one-handed. I mean, these guys... I like to bring him, if I'm clearing a hideout with a ton of bad guys in it, bring you nine of these guys and you're going to make short work of it. They just do not go down and they kill everything. Just a powerful, powerful unit and a beautiful addition to the Sturgeon army. Just a few campaign tips here I want to tell you. When you're first starting off... What I would do first is just recruit a few guys. And then what you want to do is when you chase bandit groups and stuff, chase them up into these valleys and then you can pin them in the back here and you'll see throughout Sturgeon lands. There's just little areas like this or pushing guys up into this area. Or if you push them down here into the back down here in this corner out here, a lot of sea raiders will spawn. And so you can run around here and then just push them down and then put them up against the coast to trap them. And that's how you can catch them. And then what you want to do is come in and you want to start buying these Sturgeon native horses, they're going to give you that increased speed. And as quickly as you can, try to get 20 infantry guys and 20 Sturgeon native ponies. And that's going to give you that move speed to start catching up with bandit armies very quickly. You're going to want your scout if you're running an infantry heavy army to have this forest skin perk. This is going to give you minus 50% speed penalty in forest, which is going to allow you to catch everyone in the trees. But the key is your party has to be composed of 75% or more infantry units. So you're going to want to keep that ratio. Maybe get your uh, iPhone out and keep your calculator handy if you're not so good at math like me. And you can see all these trees through here and why that forest can scouting perk becomes essential. There's a ton of trees. And what else do you see a ton of? Well, you see a ton of snow. Like I said, it should be the, the Sturgeon advantage. They should have no snow movement reduction, but unfortunately you can see right there I do. However, one of the big advantages for me fighting in the snow is snow slows down cavalry troops so they don't charge, they don't hit as hard, and they're a lot easier to kill. And if it's actually snowing or raining, it reduces ranged accuracy and damage. So another thing that plays into my favor. So attacking in the snow is a huge advantage for you as an infantry focused army. All right, enough chit chat, back to war. Now battle play is easy. Form up the shield wall and we advance. And we just keep it rolling. And once we get in range here, now I like to sometimes go ahead and bring my cavalry up. You'll see my boys will come up and I'm going to send them into the enemy cavalry to go ahead and get started. 
Now, once you're in 50, 60 meter range, go ahead and get back into line formation. And this is where we do the axe throws, see? Oh, I meant to get mine out and join the throw here. And that'll soften them up, give them some damage. Get one more out. Remember, they've got six of them, so let them throw a little bit. Didn't so do good with mine. Now, I also like to work over here on the flanks. Send those cavalry in, and now we're going. Those axes still flying out. And then all you want to do is get your two-hander out and really work a flank here. So our man there is not taking his shield up so well because they're going to start pouring in. And it seems kind of cheap, but you kind of want the enemy to be distracted hitting other people so you can get here and cleave them two, three at a time. You just got to be careful with the... Don't be afraid to go overhand on some of those heavily armored guys if you need to. And just keep chopping. Cavalry, infantry, it don't matter. You are an absolute harvester, what I tell you. Just get in here with the boys and let it ride. Now, don't worry if you get low on health like that. This is where I'm talking about having that athletics to kite out. It's kind of nice. And just... There you go. And then we're back at the flank. Two, three at a time. Just give it to them. Just get in this shit with your boys and get it done. Oh God, this guy's a monster. Enough with the ponies and bows and shit. Grab your shield, sharpen your racks, advance upon your foe under the protection of the shield wall, and then, when the time is right, attack with all the violence you possess. Happy harvesting. Oklahoma out.